Hi there and welcome to the front page. We are just eight days away from the start of the Cheltenham Festival and in this latest edition we'll be looking at the big horses, the big trainers and the big themes ahead of the finest four days in the racing year as ever. We would love it if you liked, comment, shared and subscribed while you're watching and before we get going I should point out that there is no finer time to join the Racing Post Members Club than just before the Cheltenham Festival. So, our panel for our Cheltenham Festival preview programme. We are joined this week by uh, Maddie Playl and Jonathan Harding. Joining myself, Lee Motter said, guys, really looking forward to what we've got to come. Yeah, can't wait. These are the best four days of the year, isn't it? Comfortably, comfortably. Always great fun to work, long days, but good days and uh, always good stories. Yes, I definitely agree that it's the best four days of the year. And I imagine the guy we're going to speak to now probably also agrees, although for him it's almost certainly also the most exhausting four days of the year. Uh, John Pollan, Cheltenham Clerk of the Course, how are you sir? Uh, very well, thank you Lee, and uh, yes, very much the, the, the best four days of racing for me as well. John, um, how are things as we stand now on Monday, eight days out from the Cheltenham Festival? Yes, Lee, we're in a good place. We, we finished the watering um, this weekend and we've got a mixture of uh, good and good to soft ground uh, on all three courses. So old course currently good to soft, good in places and both the new course and the cross country course are good, good to soft in places. John, one of the, the themes, I suppose, of this, this whole season has been um, the lack of rain that we've had as well as the, the really cold weather. In, in, in recent weeks, there's been a narrative that um, this would be a particularly dry Cheltenham Festival and the ground would ride accordingly. But the forecast for the next few days has changed slightly, hasn't it? It has, yes. Uh, so we're now looking at some unsettled weather this week. Uh, and it's a combination of, of sort of wintry showers that could fall as light rain, sleet or even snow potentially Wednesday, Thursday. So it's definitely a mixed forecast. But back end of the week, uh, temperatures rise and uh, we could get some wet weather, some more substantial rainfall on Friday and Sunday now. Um, but then festival week itself looks to be a little bit drier, but we, we could get the odd shower through the week. Jim, what sort of totals of rain will we be expecting between now and the end of rain on Sunday? Yeah, it's diff difficult to predict because, um, you know, it just depends on how they fall, really, whether they do come as rain or, or sort of sleet. But um, it's nothing too substantial, really, until um, Friday. You're only talking sort of any anywhere between a mil and three mil, potentially. But then Friday itself could be a little bit more, sort of four to six mil, and similar for Sunday as well. OK, so, Johnny, if you, if you get that amount of rain, and bear in mind you, you've stopped that watering programme now, what theoretically would we be expecting at um, one thirty on Tuesday afternoon? Yeah, so we're, we're dry today now. We've had uh, just sort of half a mil um, overnight. Uh, dry today now, tomorrow as well. Um, so if we get those those sort of showers uh, in, in whatever form they, they come, whether it be rain or sleet or snow, I think we'll be sort of in a similar position, um, you know, to, to where we are now, maybe a little bit easier. But um, as long as we don't get anything too substantial, then uh, I think we'll be around the good to soft. And, and for you, John, obviously last year was your, your first Cheltenham Festival in the job. Um, my goodness, you weren't presented with an easy one, given how much rain that we had uh, going into the, the second day. The forecast that you've got now for this week, does it make your life easier or harder than it had looked to set to be a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, well, you can look at it both ways. I suppose if we'd got that dry forecast that was initially um, that, that we were looking at, then, you know, you've got an element of control with the water that you're, you're putting on. But, um, 
you know, there's a, a little bit of uncertainty with the forecast now that we've got. We're not quite sure, you know, what we will get volume wise. There's a, a difference in the forecast that we're looking at. Um, but um, if, if we as long as we're getting some moisture, then we certainly don't need to be watering. Uh, and, and, you know, we've got the the weekend ahead of the festival should nothing materialize just to catch up if we had to. But um, there seems to be some some certainty around uh, getting some moisture. It's just what volume. And John, there was a, you've spoken yourself um, about how grass growth has been an issue um, at Cheltenham this year, not surprisingly given the weather. How's that playing out now? Yeah, so we, we put the fleece down last week on the new course from the main course crossing um, up to the winning line. That was the, the the area that had suffered most really with the with with the cover it's it certainly helped it's helped pick up um and certainly where we've got the cover it's in really good good condition now um so it's it's not where we want to be but uh, given the conditions that, that we've had over the winter um you know we're, we're as far forward as we can be really and john you mentioned cheltenham week itself and the the likelihood that, that would be a drier week those four days are, are you expecting to be rain free then during the festival itself uh, not necessarily rain free it's just indications at the moment on the long range forecast is that there's nothing of significant volume um, it does look as if we may get some showers but uh, certainly nothing uh, of any substantial volume okay and finally john across those four days um, what in particular are you looking forward to uh, I think it's always great to start with that roar that everybody refers to on Tuesday. I think that sets the tone for the week. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll we'll get some great racing throughout the week and, and lots of really good stories to talk about afterwards. And hopefully a stress-free week for the clerk of the course. That would be great. Thanks, John. Um, Maddie, so we are going to get some rain this week, which means that watering won't be required, certainly in the first half of the week, according to the forecast. Um, how does that impact your thinking ahead of next week? Yeah, I think it doesn't make John's job easy as a clerk of the course, obviously having to stop that watering um, and recalibrate his thoughts with the rain forecast. But equally, I think it would be welcome news to him and a lot of the trainers. We know we've had an extended period um, of dry weather, lack of rainfall. Um, so in terms of getting that ground uh, just on the the soft side good um i think that's probably good news for for everyone and hopefully it'll be ground as it usually is on the opening day where there are no excuses for no parties um and it suits everyone and we can enjoy some competitive action yeah and the action will be competitive throughout although maybe not at 3 30 on tuesday afternoon look at the uh, current price of constitution hill in the champion hurdle and he headlines the first of our stories this week because ultimately what we all hope is that the Cheltenham Festival will be about the action on the track and loads of good news stories from great horses. And I think this year in Constitution Hill, we have a horse who probably, I think, more than any horse in Sprinter Sacra in his pomp, uh, is going into the festival with the potential to produce um, a performance that confirms him as one of the all-time greats. We've had some super horses since uh, Sprinter Sacra, but I think he set a different sort of level and there's a fair chance that Constitution Hill will do the same. Extraordinary at the festival last season, has done absolutely nothing to diminish his reputation at Newcastle and Kempton this season. And I think going right across the week, as you would hope, there are some really uh, fascinating um, stories to look forward to on the track at the other end of the festival. If you've got Constitution Hill as, as one as a potential otherworldly performer, Galapin Deschamps could conceivably be that in the Gold Cup. He certainly has a towering um, reputation and that's a Gold Cup stacked with interest. A Plutard, if he came back to what he did last year when he was a superb winner of the Gold Cup and Rachel Blackmore, he'd set a stiff target. Uh, Noble Yates represents Emmett Mullins who's sort of risen from being a trainer that you associated as someone who could uh, land a plot um, with a horse to someone who's now got a, a stable full of, of top talent. And this could be a festival that really confirms that um, with him as well. Brave man's game for Paul Nichols in the Gold Cup. And Paul could have a, a, a really good Cheltenham festival, two years without a win. But his squad looks particularly strong this season. That first day of the festival could be just packed with interest. The very first race you've got um, 
the possibility of a red hot Irish banker in Fasal Vega. The last few days, every day he seemed to shorten in the betting. Willie Mullins sounds particularly bullish about him. But you've also got a one time Derby favourite in that in high definition. As well as Constitution Hill, you've got Honeysuckle bowing out in the mayor's hurdle. Wednesday's got the three E's of Energumen, Edwardstone, and Tadjit in the champion chase. Thursday, Shishkin. Can he bounce back from last season's flop in the Ryanair Chasers odds on favourite? And a stayers hurdle that could produce a three-time winner in Flooring Porter as well. It, it, it looks to me, John, um, a stunning Cheltenham Festival, albeit at this point a week out, I'm never not like a kid approaching Christmas. Yeah, and I'd be similar to you. I mean, it, it stacks up in terms of quality, absolutely. I think you've, you've singled out those horses in the right order. I think Constitution Hill is the, the superstar going into it. And... For me, the mark of a, a really great horse is when you almost half expect them to win by half the track and you're a little bit disappointed if they don't. And he has been doing that fairly consistently, um, sort of t 10, 20 length victories. And he's, you know, it's interesting he's trained by Nicky Henderson as well, because he seems to have this kind of link to these really great horses with Altior, Sprinter, Sacra coming into it. And he look, looks to me like he has another in that absolute top bracket. And Gallop and Deschamps is another one who is perhaps just half a step behind Constitution Hill in that he hasn't quite fully confirmed that, but he, there's no better place to do that than the Gold Cup. Matty, are you expecting something extraordinary from Constitution, Constitution Hill, or do you actually think um, it's a, a stiffer test for him than we have perhaps billed it as? We're still getting to know him, aren't we, really? Mm. Um, he's shown an incredible amount of ability and took um, several steps forward in a short amount of time. I think the stage is set for him to produce a huge performance, but this is his toughest task yet. Um, State Man from Ireland, of course, has passed all of his tests uh, with flying colours over there. And I think even um, we had an interview with Sam Tristan Davis recently. I like to move it. It's probably the next best of, of the British. Um, I think the race could set up for a real superstar performance um, and he's clearly got it in him. Um, we've just got to wait and see. What about the Gold Cup, John? Again, is Galapin Deschamps worthy of similar star billing as Constitution Hill going into the Cheltenham Festival or do you think he's got quite a lot to prove still? Going into it, I think he still has a little bit to prove in what isn't a very open race. I mean, Constitution Hill's clearly scared a few potential runners off whereas I think there's a few trainers, Paul Nichols, for instance, who's quite bullish about Brave Man's game and quite happy to go and take on Gallop and Deschamps. I think he was said a while ago that he was short enough, and I think that's right. I think he's probably too short based on what he's done. But I wasn't as dispirited by his last run as everybody else seemed to be. I quite like watching a horse have to tough it out, and the way he finished the race, for me, suggests he's going to have no problem in the Gold Cup. But it's a Gold Cup, and it's... <laughs> It's one of those races that tends to throw up something and he is probably too short for a race that demanding. But I hope that he can confirm himself as a superstar. Do you know what I'm looking forward to? Go on. Every year, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it, um, Jonathan's story in a bit, about the Irish dominance, Willie yeah. Mullins being so dominant. But I'm looking forward to a bit of drama. Go on. We do. Well, we do. We get surprise winners at the festival yeah. every year. Everyone seems to know all the answers beforehand, and, and that's the fun of it. Um, but I just want something to surprise me, and I want something unexpected to happen, whether it's a, a God forbid, a Gallop and Deschamps, you know, last fence mishap or, you know, something else bizarre, a might bite veering over the track. Um, I think they're the things that really sort of bring excitement to the festival and, and give you something unexpected. So I'm hoping we get a few surprise results along the way. Funny, it's funny you said that. In many ways, I thought that Galapin de Chion final fence fall, like obviously once you knew it was up okay, it was yeah. fine, in many ways provided the defining moment of the Cheltenham Festival because for a single, single slice of drama, a horse who was producing that sort of performance to come down at a fence where over the years very few horses actually come down at that final fence on the new course. It's not a fence that generally um, causes many problems. That was astonishing. Had echoes of Annie Power. I was going to say, yeah. let's, let's talk about that. I mean, we always get these narratives about big accumulators and, and the like, and I think that's part of the experience, isn't it? Just recognising those patterns and, and following themes throughout the week. So we could have uh, Willie Mullins bettering last year's tally of 10, um, but I hope there'll be a few uh, surprises along the way anyway. And John, aside from Gold Cup and Champion Hurdle, anything that you're 
uh, looking forward to even more than usual? I, I, usually the Ryanair is a race that leaves me a little bit mm. cold. Um, we've had a very good horse in Alaho in the last couple of years who's sort of, I think, elevated that race perhaps a little bit. But that is an intermediate race that you think could Alaho have got run in a gold cup, for instance, if it wasn't there. Yeah. But actually, this year I'm very much looking forward to it because of that sort of Shishkin redemption arc. I mean, he was billed, you're talking about Constitution Hills and Sprinter Sacras. Maybe he wasn't quite, he wasn't quite that level, but he was billed as potentially being the next coming and didn't quite work out. So for him to bounce back as he did at Ascot so impressively, and now to be a British odds-on favourite at the festival will be really exciting. I think he'll generate a lot of interest. And Marty, what about among the novices, chasers and hurdlers? Any horses in particular that you're thinking, oh, I can't wait to see him or her? Uh, probably a little bit left field. Uh, the real whacker is a favourite <laughs> okay. of mine. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they do throw him in the Gold Cup. Do you you think, know. Yeah. I, ju judging, judging by the way they've, they've fielded the questions put their way and they mentioned the race unprompted after he won the dipper, um, I love a front runner, I love a bold jumper. Uh, he's just took his form to a totally new level over fences. Yes, admittedly, there are others with stronger form, but it's the style in which he does it for me. He represents everything that's great about racing and represents some underdog connections that we're not used to seeing. Um, if he won, that would be fantastic scenes in the winner's enclosure, I'm sure. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing him. Then you throw in John Bon, El Fabiolo, yeah. Dysart, Dynamo in the Arkle. Um, there's so much to look forward to. Yes, so, so much to look forward to. And you can also look forward to seeing what John and Maddie are giving as their Cheltenham Festival tips at the end of the programme. Uh, before we go into story two, I wish to advise you how you can claim £200 plus in free bets. Okay, we've discussed which horses we are most looking forward to at the Cheltenham Festival. Inevitably, uh, there is enormous rivalry between Ireland and Britain. And I say it in that order because in the last two years, it's very much been Ireland dominating the Cheltenham Festival. Will that be the case again this year, John? Well, it's, it's always a common theme, certainly in the last two years, isn't it? This Ireland v Britain and the Irish dominance, I think, has, has been plenty of column inches written about that. I mean, the early market suggests that it might well be another Irish-dominated festival, simply because, as you've written about in your comment piece today, 22 of the 28 races, the sort of standout favouritism or close to favouritism are uh, Irish, and 12 of those are, when, when you say Irish-dominated, you say Willie Mullins-dominated, essentially, because 12 of those are Willie Mullins-trained. And to have 12 favourites from 28 races is just a sign of Willie Mullins' dominance of this meeting and to have 10 winners last year and to even be having the conversation that he might better that this year just is extraordinary. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, I think that there is a suggestion that it's going to be Irish dominated. I think Britain have got good chances though, it's important to know. Um, these things are cyclical and I think British strength is improving. So as you mentioned there, Paul Nichols has got a few really solid horses, Brave Man's Game, Hermes Allen, Constitution Hill and Shishkin, obviously mm. trained by Henderson. So I don't think necessarily it's going to be as, as much of a stark contrast as it has been in the last couple of years. But that is the direction of travel. That's the way it is at the moment. The Irish trainers do have a stranglehold on the festival. And that is reflected, I believe, in the, the average starting price of favourites. So I've been doing a bit of data diving and getting a bit nerdy with it. And the average SP of favourites has dropped below three from 2020, 21, 22. Mm. So less than three to one average favourite. And that pretty much correlates with Willie Mullins really hitting his stride and Ireland really hitting their stride. So it will be interesting to see what happens. Um, I'm hoping it's a little bit more even. For much of the festival last year, it was even, as was, you've written here. Yeah. I mean, going into Friday, it was within... 11.10. 11.10, yeah. yeah, you know, within touching distance. Okay, we always knew Ireland had strong chances on the final day, but for them then to basically go through the card was extraordinary. And 
we don't know. Like we say, we want upsets. There might be upsets, but the, the early market suggests it could be an Irish festival again. Maddie, I made the point in the column. I'm not really sure it is GB v Ireland. I think it's Willie Mullins v everybody else. He's got 12 favourites so far at the festival, and he was by far and away the leading trainer last season. Henry de Bromad and Gordon Elliott um, had, had good meetings, but so did Paul Nichols. Oh, sorry, so did Nicky Henderson. Um, do you see it as Ireland v Britain or Mullins against the rest? Probably Mullins against the rest. Um, Gordon Elliott seemed to send hope. Uh, send over so many horses in recent years. I'm not sure if he's quite got that strength in depth this year. He's got some fantastic chances, um, but it's going to be Willie Mullins' uh, domination again, I think. Last year, Britain got off to a pretty good start. I mean, how many of the first races did we win? Uh, and some first good three. results in the handicaps yeah. as well. Um, so there's reason to be hopeful, but um, I think some of the races this year, even if you take out the, the favourites, the Irish and in particular Willie Mullins have such strength in depth uh, and dominance. Um, so I, I think it would be logical to suggest that he's going to rack up a similar tally to next year. But maybe the, the other Irish trainers are going to struggle to get a look in as well as the British. I suppose the, if you're anyone other than Willie Mullins, if, if you look at the novices going into the festival, bumpers and hurdlers in particular, you say, well, this is going to replicate itself and repeat itself um, for years to come, and, and you look, I made the point in the column, you look at the uh, Simon Minear Isaac Swade squad for the Cheltenham Festival. Now, once upon a time, they would have had lots of exciting young talent in British stables, horses like It's My Way, and Anne Perry Pass, and El Fabiolo might have been with Nicky Henderson, or Alan King, or Nigel Tristan Davis. But now, with Willie Mullins, Willie Mullins doing so well, their good young horse seem to automatically go in that direction. Yeah, I guess um, there was a recent piece in the paper, um, just going slight off on a tangent there, that Cheveley Park, you look at the strength and depth they've had in previous years. This year, not so much. Obviously, their big hope, Alaho's out of the Ryanair. That's a high-profile example. But it just shows how these things can change quite quickly. And finally, do, do, we talk about the rivalry between the two nations, and it is a fantastic thing. But equally, I always think when you look at the, the Irish winners at the Cheltenham Festival, the jockeys tend to come in waving the flag and there's wonderful hoopla about it. You don't see very many British winners come in with a jockey waving a Union Jack or an English flag or a Scottish flag or a Welsh flag. Does it, does it matter to people over here? I like the idea of the Presbury Cup because yep. it just adds another little layer of intrigue. But I think that is all it is. I don't think anyone's really closely I don't know if people are as bothered at it as it as perhaps the, the organizers are I, do, I personally don't really see it as anything more than just another little curio that we can follow and quite a nice way of just getting a bit of back and forth maybe a bit of rivalry a bit of banter but I don't really I don't think anyone puts that much into it I think that the Irish element's interesting because they are kind of the away team a little bit and they're coming over to the British patch, as it were, and dominating. So I think it's there's probably a, a case of that a little bit, a little bit of pride in that. But I don't think the British trainers will be too, too concerned with the press recall. They'll just be glad to have a winner potentially. Yeah, and I, I guess pretty much anyone apart from Willie Mullins would feel the same. I think it's good to have balance, though. I mean, I used to be of that view. Oh, I just want to see great horses. I don't really care where they're trained, but. If you've got this sort of isolated dominance in one particular area, I think it can get a bit repetitive and, and people like to see something new, don't they? And, and get behind their own as well. So it would be great if we can sort of engage in that banter with a little bit more yeah. substance, if we can have a good few winners. Yeah, well, let's hope then that going into Friday uh, this year, it's something like 11, 10 again, although looking at the Friday card and particularly the Triumph Hurdle, it could easily end up being uh, an Irish whitewash on the final day once more. Okay, the top horses, the top trainers have been discussed. What other themes might we expect to crop up during Cheltenham Festival 2023, Maddie Playle? Yes, yeah, so a lot of these people would probably think I'm gonna take a negative stance. So I'm gonna try and be positive. Um, Good. Naturally, the racegoer experience must come first. I think we've just seen a great example of that over the weekend, by the way, at Kelso. Um, I wasn't there, but on TV and speaking to people who were there, it seemed like it was just such a wonderful meeting. We had some great results and, and prize money was rewarded with great racing. So hopefully that can continue and that momentum's brought into the Cheltenham Festival. A few themes to note. Um, capacity's been set at 68,500 people per day. Um, the two days that would obviously have, have 
been capped last year with the Thursday and the Friday where there were about 73,000 people there. Um, there were lots of people talking about queues for toilets, for, for beers, um, and I think Cheltenham have embraced some technology. They've been putting some fancy videos out on social media about these new beer taps they have. So maybe that will help with the customer service on, on that front. Um, and antisocial behaviour as well, we heard uh, in our paper quite amusingly, but it is a serious issue a couple of weeks ago about Cheltenham's uh, local government's war on we uh, and the fact they're implementing hydrophobic paint um Cheltenham probably going to put a load more toilets on as well so that's a good thing um sadly the rail strikes um are going to impact the meeting on Thursday and that of course could um knock over into the gold cup day so hopefully that's going to cause minimal disruption um you were saying with national express of, of um the Cheltenham have paid the National Express to put on several coaches and given quite a lot of support in that direction. So I'll defer to uh, that in just a moment. And of course, it wouldn't be the front page if we didn't mention the whip. Um, so we'll see um, how the bans and disqualifications go down at the meeting. Um, I spoke to Richard Patrick, one of the jockeys. He's not going to be able to ride on Gold Cup Day. Uh, he spoke quite maturely about it. He, he did say jockeys were petrified to use the whip, but at the same time, he accepted that the rules are there. And personally, I'm hopeful they'll adapt. I'm hopeful they'll adapt and um, we can focus on, on the racing for all the right reasons. Um, so fingers crossed we're in for a good week and there have been things put in place to hopefully improve the race goer experience because there were quite a few complaints last year um, and we need this execution to go smoothly and we want everyone to have a great time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose the, the two things that the sport always dreads going into a Cheltenham Festival or a Grand National meeting are um, whip stories and also cause fatalities. We desperately don't want either of either of those um john maddy expressing some hope there that the whip won't be a a huge issue during the cheltenham festival certainly the the trajectory has been positive in the first two weeks um or from week one to week two of the the new uh the new rules being in place jockeys like sam twist and davis and jonathan burke and maddie's referencing richard patrick have spoke maturely about it in recent days. I guess I suppose the difference is some is there's a lot of Irish jockeys coming in who haven't been uh, able to bed into this in the way that the British jockeys have been. Are you uh, confident or hopeful that the, the whip won't flare up during the festival or in the week after the festival? I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. Cautiously optimistic. Cautiously optimistic. We, look, we, we keep People keep talking about the timing. We've been there. It's not ideal. The horse has already bolted on that one. We have the new whip rules. We are where we are. I've been actually quite um, surprised is the wrong word, but quite pleasant. It's been good to see the way that, in particular, senior jockeys have adapted. They just spoke about being careful in the build-up, and they're aware of their responsibility. I think sometimes we don't give jockeys enough credit in their ability to adapt. And I'm hoping, certainly from the British perspective, it's not going to be a big issue in those races. That said, the, the rules are sort of trying to combat that win at all cost mentality and Cheltenham is, I think I said this last week, it is a win at all yeah. costs meeting. Whether you like it or not, the stakes are higher and there is more emphasis on it and it is a bit, the adrenaline is going to be running that little bit more when there's nearly 70,000 people cheering in the stands. So jockeys will be mindful of that. I'm optimistic in terms of the Irish jockeys. They haven't had the luxury of a bedding in period, but they are still professionals. They do still understand how to ride horses way better than any of us do. And I'm sure they will do their absolute utmost to adapt. What we don't want, obviously, and it would be an absolute nightmare, is if we do have connections celebrating winning the Gold Cup, let's say, and then getting disqualified or knowing that they're going to yeah. be disqualified. If that would be the absolute nightmare scenario. Yeah, I, th I agree. I think that's the thing that I would maybe fear most if we had yeah. a winning where it was obvious, looking at replays, the jockey had broken the rules and then you have to go through the farce of getting the only trainer jockey onto the podium, knowing that the following Tuesday they're going to be thrown out. But I still think that jockeys go into this meeting knowing what the rules are and to go four over the limit, knowing that threat of DQ is there. I, I, maybe I'm a naive optimist, but I can't see that happening at the festival. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, last week, I've, not that I've gone full circle on this, but I do, I want to be hopeful. Um, and we've, we've had a lot of negative um, sort of attention on this. Um, 
I said that the, the stakes were at the highest last week um, and it would be a nightmare, you know, if, if these were dominating the headlines with whip bands. But at the same time, as much as the stakes are the highest, jockeys would also, you'd hope, be way more mindful of going over in big races um, than they would be necessarily at a smaller meeting. Mm. Um, as much as it might be that win at all costs mm. mentality, um, they're going to know they're on the biggest stage and they're not going to want these opportunities to be taken away from them. That does slightly concern me though in the sense that will jockeys, because if it's so much in the back of their mind, if it's such a preoccupation, is that going to affect their riding? Is that going to be a yeah. sit where perhaps they're holding 5% back? We want them to be making their horses as competitive as possible, obviously within the rules, but it is such a fine line. And I think my chief concern would be not so much the, the amount of strikes because anybody can count, but that, that above shoulder height position, if people are adjusting their action in a finish and I don't know. There's, it all comes back to the timing, but mm. like we yeah, are where we are. Yeah, they're finding these boundaries, aren't they? And mm. I think that's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick to achieve, particularly for those Irish riders coming over who haven't had to ride in these same conditions before. Um, but as I said last week, we just got to put our trust in the participants. Um, and we have seen a positive move um, in terms of number of bands. We have. And I think in terms of the Irish jockeys coming over, it's also the case that these are top level um, sports people and jockeys always have to adjust according to where they're riding. If you go to ride in France now, there's a four strike limit. You can't you can't get banned in France and say that your excuse was that you're riding in different rules in your home jurisdiction. That argument about jockeys maybe not riding to the maximum of their potential ability because of the, the rules. Well, again, sports people always have to uh, compete within set limits. Maddie, you're a big F1 fan. You can't just drive your car into a gap that isn't there. Um, so the jockeys have to ride within uh, interference rules uh, limits. I think as well, John Pauling, we spoke to earlier on, his predecessor, Simon Clace, in the job a few years ago, actually something that was helpful in this regard in that if you look at old Cheltenham Festival videos in the hurdle race on the old and new courses the final flight used to come quite early uh, Simon pushed it much closer to the winning post partly to bring the drama uh, to the grandstands but also mindful of the fact that if you have a final flight close to the winning post then in theory you might reduce the prospects of jockeys going over um, with the whip in the closing stages. Maddy, those issues, the other issues that you reference at the top of, of the piece there, I think the attendance is one, is um, definitely worth highlighting there because Cheltenham did feel they had an issue last year with too many people being on the site on the, on the Thursday and the Friday. Ask also found that during the, the first post-COVID year, that having fewer people at Royal Ascot made a big difference to and people's that was enjoyment. Yeah. It was, yeah. And obviously, in that first COVID year, they were heavily restricted, but they still brought the numbers down. Cheltenham have done the same. I think that's a move to, to be applauded. I do too. The only thing I would say is, um, as I said when I introduced it, that would have only impacted the two days um, at last year um, with the cap. And I was among uh, quite a group of people having a less than ideal experience um, last year. I mean, traffic was awful. Getting in and out was incredibly difficult. Um, I think they've done some work on that as well. Um, and also when it rained on the Tuesday, there was a lot of people sort of clamoring to get indoors. There wasn't a lot of space. It wasn't comfortable. Look, we know that, you know, not everyone is, is going to have a, a perfect experience um, at events like this. But hopefully this will help ease the pressure on facilities a little bit because this is what it's about. Um, Cheltenham, you know, they, they have the infrastructure in place um, and the, that race goer experience must come first. How much is the price of Guin uh, pint of Guinness? That's the big question. 750. I don't mm. like Guinness. Do you like Guinness? Love it. Do you like Guinness, Maddie? Yeah, I'm partial to, to Guinness, yeah. I sounded a bit too enthusiastic for Guinness then. But yeah, but these are things, these are going to be considerations. And when people talk about the meeting, it's slightly, you're going to get people who probably like us, who are exclusively there for the racing and want to just watch the horses, be by the parade ring. But there are going to be people who are there on, as more of a social occasion. And, you know, we can, we can laugh about the price of Guinness, we can laugh about access to the bars, but these are vital when they go home at the end of the day, they'll talk about the racing, but they'll also say, we had a good day, it was a good experience. It was, 
we were served promptly, we weren't waiting around in the rain. These are all important things, so the fact that they're aware of it is very encouraging, the fact they've done something about it even more so. As well as you mentioning um, race car experience for more sort of casual fans, I've heard from quite a few people in recent years who have gone, do you know what, I've had enough as a racing lover and it's yeah. just too much for me these days. So I think at least we've got proof that Cheltenham are listening um, and trying to uh, improve matters for all different kinds of fans. And in terms of fans, do you know my my biggest uh, of the week is, aside from Constitution Hill, I think on the Friday, as we get towards the Martin Pipe, there will be racecourse communal singing before the finale. That's where they're singing, please don't take me home. And I think that could become a new festival norm. And if it is, I say fantastic. It upset a few people last oh, year, didn't it? Oh, God. If that upsets you, then you are very easily upset. I think a roar at the start of the meeting, a bit of singing at the end of the meeting, fabulous. Don't yeah. mind that at all. Love it. As, you know, people aren't t ripping their shirt off and letting flares off and doing it. You know, it's not like other sports. It's a, very, it's a fairly innocent little bit of singing. Yes. Love it. And I can guarantee that all members of the Racing Post team at Cheltenham will keep their shirts on throughout the Cheltenham Festival. That then brings us to the end of this week's show. I have to determine who has the the winning story. Um, I, I have an enormous guilt complex and I gave myself the winning story last week, which means, although I think the top horse is probably the, the, the most important thing of the week, I can't give it to myself this week. Um, Maddie, uh, love your story about the, the issues, um, but we don't want things like the whip to be a big issue. And so in the hope that it won't be, and in the certainty that uh, there will be great rivalry and stories about the, the battle between Britain and Ireland and Willie Mullins and everybody else, John, you can have the winning story this week. Thank you. There you go. Isn't that lovely? Um, before we end the programme and get the team's winning naps, I need to uh, advise you that now again is the perfect time to download the Racing Post app. <laughs> Yeah, please do download the Racing Post app. It is a fabulous thing indeed, as will be the Cheltenham Festival naps from Jonathan Harding and Maddie Play. In, on a program list, it is compulsory to ask for your, for your nap of the meeting. Uh, Jonathan Harding, your nap is? Well, we were having a conversation before about Editor Jajit, and he's oh. been in my mind for a while, and today's front page story has really helped. A lot of confidence from Gary Moore, I think, he has beaten both of them already at Cheltenham in the rearranged Clarence House. And I, I can't see why he's that much bigger. And the market's got a lot of confidence in Edward Stone and in uh, Energumen, quite rightly. But I just think at the prices, he's a, a very good player in the champion chase. OK, Maddie Pearl, you are an acclaimed tipster. What are you tipping at the festival? Uh, I'm harking back to earlier. I'm going to go for the real whacker. Um, I think he's probably going to run in the Brown Advisory, but I wouldn't be surprised, as I said earlier, if they roll the dice and go for gold in the Gold Cup. Um, because of his connections, I think he's probably a slightly bigger price than he deserves to be. He reminds me a lot of last year's Brown Advisory winner, Lon Presser, you know, front okay. runner, bold yeah. jumper. Um, I just think he's been underestimated. Don't think people have given him quite the credit he deserves um, for two sparkling performances at Cheltenham. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing him. OK, like both those, do you want to know what mine is? Go on then. Go on. <laughs> you shouldn't really want to know what mine is. I think Filey Bay in the county hurdle. I thought he had a huge yeah. race in the bet hurdle last time. I think he's probably still fairly handicapped. So Filey Bay for me, uh, Editor G for John, uh, The Real Whacker for Maddie. Three tips there then for the Cheltenham Festival. Thanks to John and to Maddie. Thanks to John Pullen for talking at the top of the programme. No programme uh, for us next week because you'll have other things to be doing on the Monday before the festival. But we're back the following Monday for a comprehensive Cheltenham review programme. Until then, have a great time. If you're going to Cheltenham, if you're watching Cheltenham on TV, listening on radio, enjoy the finest four days of the year and we'll see you in a fortnight. Bye-bye.